client apparently went back to the PSC because if they didn't take the jurisdiction, you perhaps sought it from them to uh, go into a friendly forum to get that very issue now decided at the administrative level, having been sent to court in the first place. How does that serve the underlying policy purposes in terms of collateral estoppel and in lessening litigation? Well, Your Honor, I, I think the, the problem I have with, with that is that the Commission didn't lose jurisdiction over the water company or over the service provided by the water company simply because the water company went to court. Uh, to attempt to collect its bills. People, uh, uh, utilities go to court hundreds of times a year and attempt to collect bills. And if a ratepayer who didn't pay its bill raised issues of utility service, I don't believe that there's anything, any support in the law or any place else that indicates that the Commission's uh, jurisdiction over the utility service has been removed from it and placed in the hands of the uh, of the, of the, uh, the judge in the court simply because the, the utility has gone to court in an attempt to collect its uh, charges that are due and owing. The jurisdiction remains with the commission over utility service and there's no uh, sunset or any other kind of provision in the law for when a uh, utility company attempts to go uh, into court and collect its bills. Does that make the court the handmaiden of the commission and see how things work out and see how the flow of the litigation goes and, and it's in control of the parties? That's the mischief part of this that concerns me. Well, I think this is just a question of, of who has jurisdiction over, or at least primary jurisdiction over service issues. And this has been something that has been delegated by the legislature in the public service law to the Public Service Commission. And they are the ones that have the initial say as to whether and to what extent uh, a utility has provided adequate service. And if the commission makes a decision that is, uh, that is not in the, that the, the parties do not like, they have, of course, have the opportunity to challenge it in an Article 78 proceeding. And assuming, that, assuming you're correct, they, did they not defer in connection with that uh, and, you know, direct, in effect, direct the parties to court to resolve the law issues with respect to past uh, uh, charges? No, Your Honor. They, we were requested to go to court to collect our past charges, but not to litigate the issue of utility service. Uh, that was not, uh, I don't think there's anything in the record that indicates that the Commission at any time wanted the issue of utility service litigated. How could that be resolved other than uh, the past charges be resolved other than on the determination of that question? Because uh, very simply by, by observing that the, the company is a, is a customer, they fired us as a customer of the company, that we have a tariff in effect, which provides for charges, and that the <clears throat> and that the fire district didn't pay its bill. That was the basis of our uh, our cause of action. And the tariff is a legally enforceable contract between uh, the fire district and the and the water company. And we were directed to attempt to go ahead and collect under that tariff. Mr. Reed, I, I've now read the or reread the letter you've uh, you've directed my attention to at pages 10a and 11a, where you say that the Public Service Commission had made a, reached some sort of determination about the adequacy of service. And the difficulty I'm now having is if they reached this determination in June of 1984, why then did they order a formal investigation in March of 1985 into the adequacy of service? Well, that was after, uh, after Judge, Justice Garayan had determined that the Commission hadn't made uh, any findings as to adequacy of service sufficient for him to award summary judgment. The, there was virtually a year's time that elapsed. We had commenced the proceeding subsequent to the time of the letter uh, that was sent by uh, Chairman Joya to the, to the fire district. And then we proceeded again in a motion to renew, and that's where we started the whole thing over again. Excuse me. Did, um, so finally, I would just like to say that in the, in the uh, Public Service Commission proceeding, uh, the, uh, the appellant had the full opportunity to participate and did participate. The only thing he didn't do was, uh, was call witnesses, but that was entirely up to him and it was entirely his choice. He was aware that the issues uh, that were going to be discussed were identical to the issues um, for which he was seeking to litigate in the court case, a matter which we had discussed. And I believe that concludes uh, all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reed. Allied Chemical versus Niagara Mohawk.
Feigenbaum, I have uh, Exhibit 1 in front of me, and it, it reads very much like a judicial decision, actually. Uh, this matter was, was uh, fully litigated, wasn't it? The same as a case in a different form. I, I beg to differ, Your Honor. Uh, I, just as I don't believe um, litigants could confer subject matter jurisdiction on a court, uh, I don't believe that litigants can, or, or the uh, Public Service Commission can assume jurisdiction uh, that it does not have. An issue was presented, just as in every rate proceeding or every rate-making activity by the Public Service Commission, issues are presented to the Commission for determination, and determinations are made. There is no question but that a determination was made here, as in every rate proceeding. But this, but this determination really didn't reflect on the rate proceeding as such. Uh, the, the, the decision itself uh, has a, has, is a discrete decision with respect to the contract. Well, uh, even the uh, Fourth Department uh, uh, found, Your Honor, that the Commission, sua sponte, converted what started out as a dispute between two parties into a generic rate proceeding. Uh, yes, a determination was made. There's no question. But going into that, there was no reason for Allied to believe that all the extant principles governing the activities of the Public Service Commission were out the window, such as rate making may only be prospective, rate determinations may only be prospective, and uh, that the Commission does not have the power to redefine a federally defined term, meaning qualifying facility. Uh, this was not uh, addressed in a vacuum. Uh, I think it must be kept in mind that this proceeding started uh, with the Con Edison proceeding, 27574, uh, in which, by the way, Niagara Mohawk was an active participant, and in which uh, both the Commission and Niagara Mohawk addressed the subject of treating the possibility of treating qualifying facilities providing new capacity differently from those providing old capacity. And the option to do so was rejected at that time. Therefore, when the tariff was promulgated, there was no reason to believe that anything had changed. And if anything were to change, as is often the case in rate making activity by the Public <laughs> Service Commission, it would change for the future. So there was a determination for the future, and that determination, insofar as it has an in futuro effect, is not being challenged here. All that is being challenged is that period when, according to law, the rate that was in effect, by definition, uh, was the rate to which Allied was entitled pursuant to the term of the contract, as it was the only general tariff in effect, and as by its terms it applied to all qualifying facilities. But yes, there was a determination, and the, I think the, the main fallacy uh, in uh, the uh, position of defendants and in the uh, decision below is that it speaks of the fact of a determination having been made uh, without focusing on what the determination was. And, and that's really where we differ. This was rate making. It was rate making by the Commission's own activities. It was rate making by the request, uh, starting with the caption of the petition uh, by Niagara Mohawk. Uh, all the parties understood it to be so. And under those circumstances, there are certain rules that are applicable. And Allied is now pursuing so much of what could not have been affected by that rate-making activity, and that is the difference in the rate prior to the change in 1986. The, uh, the Fourth Department speaks of, and, and there, there have been discussions today, and this appears to be collateral estoppel day uh, in the court. Uh, there in, have the been world. <laughs> in the world. In the world. No, race judicata in the world. <laughs> and we may even bind the island of Tobago. <laughs> what do we do? Um, it, it seems that um, 
the big difference has been, and, and I think this case stands in stark contrast to what has gone before, there was no adjudicatory proceeding as is contemplated by the doctrine of collateral estoppel. That is why rate making and executive actions as well are given different treatment. Uh, what we have here uh, is an Article II uh, State Administrative Procedure Act matter, as the Fourth Department found, not an Article III. Article II is entitled rulemaking, which includes rate making. Article III is entitled adjudicatory proceedings. This was an Article II proceeding. By definition, it was legislative activity. Uh, the PSC is here, um, and just briefly with respect to uh, its presence, it is here uh, by the choice of Niagara Mohawk and by the choice of the trial court. Um, there is no necessity for it to be here because its activity, insofar as it legally could act, is not being challenged. Nothing it decided to do in 1986 with respect to qualifying facilities providing old capacity is being challenged. And nothing that would happen by virtue of a reversal and granting of summary judgment to Ally would affect the legal jurisdiction or the legal power of the PSC to so act. In, in actuality, the, the whole concept of the statute of limitations, which is addressed fully in our brief, really is, is another variation on the race judicata finality uh, issue. Um, but the fact of the matter is, nothing that would happen here in favor of Allied would adversely affect the authority or power of the Public Service uh, Commission. The, um, the one remaining issue that I'd like to address is the uh, granting of summary judgment to Allied. This, it would appear, uh, is an instance in which Allied is resting its entire case on documents and statutes. I think the case law is clear that this court may grant summary judgment as Allied has appealed from the uh, denial in the uh, appellate division. And we would respectfully urge that the court do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Feigenbaum. Mr. Allen. Yes, Your Honor. I, I think I'd like to commence uh, where Mr. Feigenbaum left off with uh, Articles 2 and 3 of the State Administrative Procedure Act. History of this case is that after the contract was signed uh, and there was ar unarguably a dispute as to what the applicable provisions of, of the tariff would be, that both parties requested the commission to issue a declaratory order under uh, Section 204 of the State Administrative Procedure Act. In addition, uh, Allied filed a complaint uh, requesting retroactive imposition of a particular tariff so that Niagara Moff would have to pay Allied underneath it. The do you, Mr. Allen, do you contend that that obviates any jurisdictional issue? This obviates any jurisdictional issue? Of the Public Service Commission. Uh, the, I, I contend that both parties have considered that the uh, Public Service Commission's jurisdiction is, is primary. And that both parties asked the Public Service Commission to make such a determination. And that the plaintiff in this proceeding was just not happy with the determination made. Uh, Section 204 of the State Administrative Procedure Act specifically provides, as does Section 205, that an Article 78 <coughs> petition is applicable to requests for a declaratory ruling that have been denied or found unsatisfactory by a complainant. And that was not taken. So regardless of the collateral estoppel question, the plaintiff is necessarily out of court because he failed to follow the uh, requirements of Section 204 of the Public Service Law, the uh, State Administrative Procedure Act. As to the collateral estoppel issue, the plaintiff's claim essentially rests on the proposition that because the Commission, in addition to deciding a specific dispute between Allied and Niagara Mohawk, the Commission also decided to open a broader proceeding in the context of a rulemaking proceeding 
that that necessarily vitiates the ruling as respects the dispute between Allied and Niagara Mohawk. I submit that no court has ever so found. I don't think there is any prohibition against the Commission instituting a proceeding that has elements both of an adjudicatory nature and of a rulemaking nature, so long as the proper strictures are, re are observed in both proceedings. In this case, because there were no issues of fact, as uh, plaintiff states on a motion for summary judgment, uh, there was no need for a hearing, and the Commission, of course, decided upon the papers. Where would the plaintiff appeal this order? Who would it appeal the order to? It would, it would take an Article 78 action, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. And it failed to do so. It's time barred from doing so. The language in, in the complaint filed by Allied with the Public Service Commission said specifically, wherefore, for the foregoing reasons, Allied requests an order from the Public Service Commission requiring Niagara Mohawk to purchase power from Allied's cogeneration facility at the filed rate of SC6 PSC 207 electricity, effective March 20, 1984, and sell backup service effective March 20, 1984 as well. This is a specific request for relief from the Commission and a concession as to the Commission's plenary jurisdiction in the matter. The case of the Consumer Protection Board cited by the plaintiff is a, a totally different case. In the context of deciding rate cases, the Commission decides a multitude of issues. It's not required to be consistent from case to case because conditions change. And uh, there are very good reasons for in the, the basic rate making function of the Commission uh, not to uh, uh, hold that it is adjudicatory in nature, but that it is a, a form of legislation or rulemaking. But that is certainly not the case here, and none of the parties up until the time of the lawsuit uh, treated it as such. Allied also contends that the 1985 ruling and policy statem statement was not a final order. Uh, as to Allied's request, this contention is clearly wrong. After the 1985 ruling and policy statement, and the, the word ruling, of course, disappears from the, uh, the plaintiff's briefs in, in these matters, uh, there was nothing else that was required to, uh, to deal with Allied's uh, claimed rights. And Allied makes lays great stress on the fact that Niagara Mohawk is supposed to have made a fatal admission uh, as to the order not being final. <coughs> and a, a reading of the record of pages eight, 118 and 119 will make it clear that the company first didn't admit anything. And the second thing is, that, of course, if whatever the company might have said, its admissions uh, do not uh, relate at all to whether the order, in fact, was, was final, which can only be determined by the order itself. Our belief is that the sole question in any of the proceedings here was Allied's entitlement to the applicable rate, a, a question that was placed before the Commission for its decision. The Commission was asked to answer yes or no. The Commission answered no. And I cannot imagine a clearer example of adjudicating a dispute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Allen, Ms. Faulkner. May it please the Court. Um, I just want to start off with answering the claim that uh, Mr. Feigenbaum made that, that we are not a necessary party to this action and in no way are we going to be adversely affected by any decision in, uh, in, in this contract action. Um, basically, this claim is based on the same erroneous assumption that underlies the lawsuit and that is that a party can simply ignore a commission ruling and, uh, uh, and especially when it's a ruling that is based upon the same breach of contract claim. Uh, the statute defines necessary parties, one who is, might be inequitably affected by a judgment. And here, granting the plaintiff the relief requested would not only prejudice and undermine the commission's ruling, but would also undermine their primary jurisdiction to look at and set rates and interpret uh, tariffs which relate to pa the purchase of electricity between a utility and a facility such as Ally. But that, Ms. Faulkner, all looks to the future, does it not? That the rate making, that has a prospective quality. And that is not, the prospective ruling of the Public Service Commission is not in any sense questioned by Mr. Feigenbaum. Right, but he is, he is 
asking for damages from the time period that he initially requested it from Niagara Mohawk until we made our ruling. And in that interim period of time, we specifically stated in our ruling that they were not, not entitled to this avoided cost tariff rate as old capacity. We said in the future we may revise that provision and give you some kind of phase in over a 10 year period as old capacity, but until that time period, you are not entitled. This is not an applicable general tariff for you. And in terms of that, what leaves us behind is that they are only entitled to the contract rate. Is it clear that the uh, PSC has primary jurisdiction with respect to a dispute of this kind, not prospectively, but retrospectively, or even intermittently? Right. Well, even by the terms of the contract itself, it said that it was going to look at the applicable rate, and if I can read the language here, it said it, wa it was allowed to elect an applicable rate specified by the Commission, either in a general tariff approved by the Commission, or upon petition by either party to this agreement. And what they did here was they petitioned us and said, we feel we're entitled to this recently approved general tariff and that we are covered by it. And our position was, no, you're not covered by it. This is intended for new capacity. It does not relate to old capacity. It was never intended to be used for old capacity. Um, we will look into this. And in fact, maybe you are entitled to something more than the contract rate, and maybe we'll revise that tariff and put in this phase-in rate. And that's when they started this generic proceeding to get comments on that. But until that time, they said, you are not entitled to it. Now, if, if the other part of this agreement is if you come upon petition. And they said in this order as well, this ruling as well, if you come before us and can demonstrate that you need full avoided costs to remain economically viable or to increase your output, then we will entertain that as well. But you haven't done that, and this rate you know, this tariff rate doesn't apply, and what's left behind is the contract rate. Is the availability of collateral estoppel in this case dependent upon the exercise of primary jurisdiction by the PSC? Well, the, the PSC does have primary jurisdiction to interpret terms of the tariff. And that is one of the, you know, according to the federal case law, I haven't seen anything in the state case law, but there is, you have to leave that to the uh, commission itself. Also, setting rates are part of the primary jurisdiction of the PSC. And generally what the courts do are defer to the expertise of the commission because there are certain technical matters involved. And certainly in figuring what avoided costs are, it's a very technical area. But you would agree if it were purely rate making, the collateral estoppel availability would not be present? Well, that's not also clear. As this court stated in Manor of Venice, you can't just label something rate making or adjudicatory and just simply say that that's going to be the only criteria for determining where the collateral estoppel effect can be given. You have to look, in fact, it really depends upon the nature of the power being exercised and the particular circumstances of the case. Um, generally, when we say rate orders are not given race judicata effect, we're saying that you can't use a prior rate order to defeat or to attack subsequent rate orders because changing conditions occur and the subsequent orders reflect those changing conditions. However, until that new rate is in effect, the filed approved rate is the rate for that rate period in question. And if the parties wanted to attack that rate, they would have to do so by bringing an Article 78 proceeding. But they are inherently non-final in the usual sense that that term is uh, required in the uh, res judicata collateral estoppel area, are they not? Well, again, it's, it's it depends on the nature of the issue. Here we have a specific conduct being coming before us. Are we entitled to this rate at the present time? We said, no, you're not entitled to that rate. And, and we said, but you will be entitled to something else later on. However, that hasn't occurred yet. And what their, their contract damages only span that period of time to the time they made the request until we instituted a new tariff that specifically related to old capacity. So here it's very different. I mean, it's not every issue you can look at that way. Here we have a commission ruling that was made, and instead the parties just circumvented that ruling. They didn't petition for rehearing. They didn't petition to, uh, uh, for clarification as to what the rate would be during this interim period. Instead, they merely left it alone and sat on their rights for over a year and a half and then brought a contract action only against Niagara Mohawk. And in terms of the damages, uh, the damages they're asking for, it's $1.5 million. And the way this, if, if this relief is granted, 
In fact, the way it's collected is it's collected by the ratepayers generally through the fuel adjustment clause. And this was a very kind of uh, situation that the commission was seeking to prevent. They felt old capacity was not entitled to these full avoided costs. And this was something that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission also said was left to the discretion of state commissions to determine what rates old capacity would get because they weren't, they weren't entitled to full avoided costs. They could be given something less than that. Um, now with his claim that, that the, the reason why this order shouldn't be given any kind or is not by our statute of limitations is because we didn't have any jurisdiction. And basically what they're doing here is they're attempting to transform an argument that we erroneously decided the case into one that we have no jurisdiction for purposes of statute of limitations. In other words, they said that we erroneously decided because we we're really retroactively uh, setting rates or we were federally preempted. All of those issues could have been raised in an Article 78 proceeding. These are not issues which, in fact, mean that the Commission didn't have jurisdiction to decide it in the first place. And in fact, this Court made it very clear in matter of PSC versus Rochester Tell that if a Commission is vested with a jurisdiction to decide an issue <coughs> in the first place, then the party has to bring a timely Article 78 proceeding. They, in fact, contrasted this situation in a situation where the Commission would not have any jurisdiction. For example, if, if the Commission told Sears how much they had to charge for all their electrical appliances, then a manufacturer or Sears could in fact sue the Commission later on and not have to um, meet this four-month statute of limitations time. But in this case, that wasn't the case. They merely don't like the decision they received. They came to us. In fact, they conceded jurisdiction when they came to us. and. They even mentioned in their brief that we do have jurisdiction to set these rates and to look at these kind of contracts under PURPA, under 66C, and other, under other statutory authority. So um, for them to say now that we are barred from even uh, the statute of limitations time is simply incorrect. Uh, finally, <coughs> just in terms of their non-final uh, claim, it's very clear that we did finally decide this. Um, if they had any doubt, they could have come to us and asked what kind of, what rate they were entitled to for that time period. They failed to do this, and there's a basic principle that we have to give some kind of closure or reliance on agencies' decisions and not allow people to come in over a year and a half later and sue the utility separately under a common law remedy. Uh, for these reasons and the reasons discussed in our brief, I request that the court affirm this decision below. Thank you very much, Ms. Walker. People versus Siswas. Ready to call, please. Your Honors. Good afternoon, Ms. Cushman. Ms. Cushman, uh, doesn't it have to be in the people's possession uh, in order to be considered Rosario material? Your Honor, I don't think that that's the fact under the Perez case or under uh, the rationale which underlies Rosario or under the statute. How about Reedy? Reedy, I believe, is uh, a different case. It's a case in which the issue was whether the defendants were, uh, whether the people were required to go out and seek evidence. In any event, in that case, the court turned over the redacted, somewhat redacted prior statement or writings of the victim who had protested that these were her own personal writings. The court below in that case did direct that the, uh, the victim take out anything which did not relate directly to the events in question at the, the sexual offense of the trial. But with respect and to whether or not it was Rosario material, uh, that case doesn't help you. It doesn't help me, but I, I think that that statement is dictum and unnecessary to the result in the case. Uh, I think that all of this court's rulings and decisions pertaining to Rosario over many, many years uh, do support the proposition that where prior statements are available to the court, 
which they were here, where the substance of those statements, in effect, has been in the possession of the government, which it's my argument they were here. Uh, there is no policy reason not to require them to be turned over under Rosario or under the uh, social worker privilege, the exception to the social worker privilege. So in other words, uh, if there is a subpoena here uh, filed by the defendant, then the department should be compelled to turn it over. That's exactly what happened here, Your Honor. We did subpoena the documents, and the documents, you see, this is a case which was treated throughout the trial phase as a Rosario case. Uh, the people at this point are trying to uh, claim that at trial, uh, the trial attorney, may, namely myself, expressly waived the opportunity to argue the issue of the social worker privilege. That is belied by the full substance of the discussions pertaining to the ruling in this case on the Rosario question. Uh, Judge Egito, when he made his pretrial ruling, directed the SPCC lawyer to retain the notes and to make them available as potential Rosario at trial. The court considered them as Rosario. The SPCC lawyer said that if it should come a time when the court decided that the court would turn them over under Rosario, at that point the SPCC lawyer wished to have the opportunity to consult with his client, whether that's the SPCC or the children themselves is not clear, and to make a decision whether to press the privilege argument. The privilege argument was never discussed or raised, and indeed, had it been expressly articulated at the time of trial, you would have seen a markedly different trial record. You would have seen uh, a great many arguments pertaining to all of the issues on the privilege question, which have been developed only in the appellate stages of this case. Ms. Cushman, do we know whether or not these records were in the possession or control of the people? Was that developed as a factual matter? It was not developed as a factual matter. There was a statement made by the prosecutor that she had never read them. There was a statement made by the SPCC lawyer that, to his knowledge, they had never been provided to the prosecutor but it was not developed in any way as a factual matter. Um, similarly, it was not developed as a factual matter what I would have chosen had that issue been raised, which is that the children spent hours and hours and hours with the prosecutor during the precise period of time that they were also being interviewed as to these subjects by the, as, by the social worker, that the repetitive questioning pertaining to the facts of these events uh, had the impact of reinforcing the uh, influence of the father earlier during the period of time between when he first uh, allegedly discovered the accusations and brought the three weeks that took place before he brought them to the attention of the police. Uh, all of these things would have been developed in a more uh, complete factual way at the trial had the issue been squarely raised, but it was not. What we see is a situation where the trial judge after the fact and confronted with the obvious erroneousness of this as a Rosario decision, then makes a partially developed opinion on the basis of the social worker privilege. They're not even fleshing out the statutory privilege, but going according to case law, common law, and only on appeal is the statutory privilege adverted to and the exception which requires disclosure, which provides for permissible disclosure by way of testimony of the social worker himself or herself in the case of a child victim of a crime in any proceeding, that would mean including a criminal proceeding in which that was at issue. Now, Ms. Cushman, do you, do you argue that De Jesus compels uh, a reversal here or is there another step in the analysis that uh, we must take in the rule of law that would apply in this case? Well, the people are saying that De Jesus does not compel reversal because I must establish <coughs> that I could have developed the issue that there were factual matters rather than, than purely matters of law. 
I don't think that either you way. You respond they didn't sufficiently advance the objection on the basis of the uh, privilege, uh, although it did start to develop, which might be a distinguishing point different to Jesus, or do you say it's a distinction without I, a difference? I, as I read De Jesus, De Jesus is a very brief case, and so I don't know how much was really in the record and how much the court had to go on there. Frankly, I think that from this case, the principle that is announced in De Jesus, which is that the defense attorney should have sufficient notice and sufficient understanding of what the claim is as to why these materials are being withheld in order to develop the reasons, both policy and factual, which would compel turning them over or which would influence the trial court to turn them over. Uh, I think that those, that reasoning, which appears to underlie the Jesus, compels a reversal in this case. Well, the I, presence of the agency was a distinguishing factor, was it not? There, there was no uh, agency present in de Jesus, whereas here the agency itself retained custody of the documents. I don't recall that. It was my impression that it was a, a BCW case in De Jesus, but it may have been purely a social worker, a privately retained social worker. I'm not sure that that makes a difference. It's not clear to me whether SPCC, this is another factual uh, ambiguity. The, the people make the argument factually, the assertion that this is completely independent, does not work hand in glove with the prosecutor, is not a state agency, is not someone. I don't know whether if at a hearing pre-trial that might not have been probed further. Uh, there might have developed a relationship between the social work agency and the prosecutor's office that would suggest that the, under Rosario, as very traditionally read, the notes should have been turned over. I think that this is really a situation in which the underlying policy of Rosario, which is one of fairness that the defense is entitled to know what the statements were which were made prior to the testimony at trial, if they've been recorded in some way that the, that the defense can know them, uh, that they're entitled to make whatever use of them can be made. Our defense required a number of very difficult uh, thought processes on the part of the jury. And one aspect of it was the whole notion that inconsistencies, which may seem uh, not so significant from one to the next, over a period of time demonstrate the unreliability of what these children are saying. The evolution of the story, the increase in the amount of detail from the very cursory things that were shown uh, in the complaint, etc., cetera, uh, evolved over time. Uh, the that's hard for the jury to understand. It's hard for the jury to understand that a father could be as vicious and as abusive as the father in this case was. Thank you very much. Ted? Your Honor, if I may initially, just to set the record straight on one critical issue, um, not only was the issue of the social worker privilege raised repeatedly at, at the trial level, but in fact, in the motion to vacate judgment, which is appended to respondent's brief, page A5, defense counsel defendant specifically states that the only argument that was raised against production of these records in the first place was the social worker's privilege. So, I mean, that just, that bolsters all of the other evidence at trial that the social worker's privilege was the reason that these things were not disclosed in the first place. They were brought in by the society's attorney. They were taken back out of court by the society's attorney. The attorney said, Your Honor, these are privileged documents. We are bound by the confidentiality of the CPLR, so I have to know if you're going to require us to disclose them. I have to know so that I can confer with my client and decide what to do with respect to that privilege. The court repeatedly referred to these documents as privileged communications, confidential communications. There, there is no question that the social work privilege was fully aired and, and disposed of. In fact, the Are trial... Are those words used, Ms. Heck? Yes, Your Honor. Social um, worker privilege or 4508? Um, yes, uh, page 390 of the record. Um, it would be eight, 18, appendix 18, defendant's appendix. Um, and in addition, page 176 to 177 of the record, which would be defendant's appendix at 13 to 14. So quite unlike uh, the situation in DeJesus, where 
these matters just weren't raised and were never thrashed out and, and decided by the trial court here, we not only have the issue raised, but the trial court bases, bases its entire post-judgment decision upon having determined that the social worker privilege, in fact, must in here. Um, in addition, did the people ever raise the uh, the subject? We of were never party to it, and again, that goes to my next point, which is that this is very unlike the situation in De Jesus, where they were BCW records. They were they were requested as Rosario material from the people who refused to disclose them, and their rationale at the time of trial was these are privileged under the Family Court Act, and anyhow, we don't have anything relevant from the BCW on appeal for the first time, what the people said was these, no, these are protected by the CPLR 4508, exactly the same uh, statute. And anyhow, anything that the BCW has can't be Rosario. And what this court said reasonably enough was that nobody ever even got to examine these issues below. And that's a very different situation here. All of the discussions about the social worker privilege were between the agent for the social work agency and the court. We virtually were a, a third party with respect to all of this. Is your position simply that uh, these were not available? They were not available. Period. That's quite clear on the record. Um, it's clear from the statement of the judge, from the statement of the society's attorney, from the statements of defense counsel, from the corroboration by the prosecutor. We simply, we have never seen them. We were barred from ever seeing them by precisely the same statute and the same trial holdings that prevented the defendant from seeing them. They are confidential records. They were taken by a social worker for a completely autonomous, non-law enforcement agency that has nothing to do with our office. And un I mean, un under that set of circumstances, it can't possibly, a, a duty to disclose can't possibly arise on our account. Ms. Heck, was the issue of possession or control ever ventilated here? Well, that was quite clear. It, it's very clear. Um, you mean it was in, implicit in the... In it was the, more than implicit, Your Honor. It was expressed insofar as that it was quite clear on the record. It was stated expressly that we never had them, we never saw them, and that the society's attorney was not any more likely to turn them over to us than he was to turn them over to defense counsel. So here again, unlike to Jesus, it's, it's quite clear that whereas the, the relationship between BCW and the people in De Jesus was very hazy and there really was not enough of a factual finding as to what BCW had and what we had and what the distinction was between the two of us here. It was clear from the outset that we had nothing to do with these records and could not have gotten them if we had wanted to. Ms. Ms. Heck, uh, even if uh, these are records of an independent, non-criminal law enforcement, independent agency, and even if uh, privileged, if they had been turned over to the prosecution in any way, shape, or form to be used in connection with the case, any question but that they fall within Rosario? That, that forms a very interesting problem. Um, there, there are two answers. The first one must depend on the nature of that disclosure. Assuming it is lawful, assuming that the social worker um, were to give these statements to the prosecutor's office, with the permission of the client, who is really the only one who can decide whether or not to waive privilege. Assuming that it was lawful, the answer would be that, in that case, the privilege is waived in the same way. Hospital records in this case was waived, and there's no question that then it would become simple Rosario material, and the privilege would no longer have anything to do with the case, and then clearly the prosecutor would have a burden to disclose it. The second situation is, is much more unlikely, but it, it certainly could happen that there could be an unlawful, unlawful disclosure, or at least a disclosure without the permission or ratification of the client. Um, if a social worker... Perhaps all the more reason in that case for the defendant to have entitlement to it if in that uh, case, if certainly the defendant in the is going to be subjected to unlawful material that the prosecution has exactly. its hands on. But again, you know, that, that is a much different issue. Then we have a Rosario issue. Then we have a situation where there is this terrific unfairness and disadvantage because the prosecution has statements by a prosecution witness that the defendant doesn't have. And here that was simply not the case. But whether required lawfully or unlawfully, that fact is present. The prosecution would have, in an unfair uh, advantage kind of way, 
uh, material that ordinarily yes. should be available yes. to the defense. Clearly, yes. But of course, that was not the situation here because we never even saw these notes and they had nothing to do with our office. Um, with respect to defendant's claims that he was prevented from putting on a defense by the trial court's ruling um, regarding the cross-examination of the victims, parents, as well as his claims of an improper exclusion of expert testimony, unless the court has specific questions, the people will rely on their brief. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Retail Software Services versus Lashley. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon, Mr. Jaglum. Uh, may it please the Court, uh, I'm Andre Jaglum of Stetcher Jaglum and Prutzman, representing Retail Software Services on this certified question from the Second Circuit. The Franchise Sales Act provides for the appointment of an agent for service of process on the, uh, that's directed at officers and directors of a franchise or selling franchises in this state. Uh, the Second Circuit has asked this Court whether that appointment furnishes a basis for jurisdiction or merely an alternate method of service process, which requires some independent basis uh, for personal jurisdiction. <clears throat> we submit that it provides a basis, uh, firstly, because the appointment of an agent and the provision for service itself confers a basis for jurisdiction. And second, because uh, the protective nature of the Franchise Sales Act would be seriously undermined if the uh, plaintiffs uh, in, in an action arising under the Act are required to chase across the country uh, to obtain relief from the people that the legislature chose to make responsible for their injuries. I can, I can uh, understand why 686 would confer uh, a method of service, certainly, over the uh, franchisor of the sub-franchisor, uh, and also jurisdiction. Um, uh, acquisition of power by the state over the franchisor or the franchisor. But why does it confer personal jurisdiction over, let's say, an employee? or an agent of the franchise, or someone who has not authorized uh, the franchise or to submit himself to jurisdiction? Well, Your Honor, the statute, the statute is not the most artfully written mm -hmm. in the world, but what it says is that any person who sells franchises in the state appoints the Secretary of State as agent for service directed to that person or directed to an officer or director, among others, of such a person. Now, the well, statute... Those persons are, are defined as franchisor, sub-franchisor, or franchise sales agent. Yes, Your Honor. Now, there, there, I think, are two reasons that it seems clear that the legislature intended the appointment to run to the employee, the officers, the directors as well. First of all, uh, subdivision 13 of uh, section 681 of the act defines a person as including the uh, controlling officers and directors of that person. So that when the statute says that a person acting uh, as a franchisor makes that appointment, uh, that also has to be read to include that the directors and officers also make that appointment. But secondly, if the uh, statute is read as saying that the officers and directors are not included in the appointment, then those words in Section 686 have no meaning at all. Well, now, appointment has two effects. And uh, I'd say arguably, and, and perhaps you're absolutely right, that, that the um, agents, the employees, or whoever they might be of the franchise or uh, may be properly served for subpoena purposes or summons or whatever because of uh, 
686. I think that that's so. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about personal jurisdiction over someone other than the franchisor, sub-franchisor, or sales agent. Yes, Judge and, and how can someone be subjected to the power of the state, uh, someone who would not otherwise be subjected to the power of the state, without that person's permission? unless the person's doing something that might come within uh, international shoe or something like that, and that's not contested here. We're only talking about this statute. How, how does it do it? That's what I don't understand. Focusing purely on the statutory question, and, and I, I gather that you want me to leave aside, at least for the time being, the constitutional issue. Uh, focusing on the statutory question, it does it in the same way that the statutes which make the director of a corporation in states like Delaware subject to the jurisdiction of that state. In Armstrong versus Pomerantz, uh, the Delaware Supreme Court was faced with a very similar situation. And uh, there you had a statute which simply provided that a director who, after a certain date, accepted a directorship in a Delaware corporation uh, was consenting to the service of process on a statutory agent. Uh, and in Armstrong v. Pomerantz, when they discussed that statute, what the statute, what the court said was that the statute provided for a consent to jurisdiction. And it's very interesting that they use the words consent to jurisdiction, although the statute speaks only of consent to appointment of an agent. When the appellees here accepted their positions in a corporation which was a national franchising corporation. They were selling franchises all around the country. They should have known that in those states which regulated franchises, and there are many of them, New York is certainly not unique, they would face consequences if they acted fraudulently and illegally. These appellees personally made misrepresentations, significant misrepresentations about the management of the corporation and about the uh, financial condition of the corporation. And in doing so, they subjected themselves to the consequences of that action. They were made liable individually for that fraud by the legislature, and the legislature provided that they should be subject to service of process. And I submit that if with that action by the legislature, you nevertheless say that no, you've got to go to California to recover from these people when you've got a bankrupt franchisor who can't respond, you've undermined the protective purchase of that well, purpose I, of that I, statute. I don't want to come back to the same thing, but I'm doing it. You said subject to service of process. Yes. But is that the same as subject to jurisdiction? I believe it is, uh, Judge Hancock. I believe that when a legislature provides for service of process, it is providing for jurisdiction. Uh, first of all, the method of uh, providing for service here was through the appointment of an agent. And the existence of an agent in New York itself confers jurisdiction, because the defendants are present in New York through their agent. And the statute is explicit in saying that service on the Secretary of the State has the same validity as if it was served on these people uh, personally. And when the legislature said that, it seems to me it manifested in its intent quite clearly that they be subject to jurisdiction. Now, I am not aware of any case, no case was cited by the appellees below where they did appear and contested this quite vigorously. Uh, it was their motion, after all. And no case was cited uh, by the Eastern District in which a statutory or other appointment of an agent for service was held to be merely an alternate method. It has always been considered to be uh, a conferral of a basis for jurisdiction as well. Mr. Jaglin, uh, I have a, just a, a procedural difficulty. Is any challenge being made to the constitutionality of your reading of the statute? <coughs> uh, the, <coughs> the issue was addressed below, and uh, the Eastern District certainly addressed it. The constitutionality question, however, I think is answered very clearly uh, by the S United States Supreme Court's decisions in Calder versus Jones and Burger King. Yes, but uh, do you have an adversary in the Second Circuit? In the Second Circuit, they did not appear. 
uh, I, uh, uh, there, was, there was a submission of one or two pages in the Second Circuit by one of the appellees in which he basically said that uh, he intended to rely on the decision below for his argument and uh, that uh, uh, he, he put in one or two other uh, Is it pages. your position that the issue of constitutionality needs to be addressed? Well, uh, we're here on a certified question, and uh, the certified question is the construction of the statute. But that obviously, does take into account constitutionality, does it not? Obviously, this court doesn't want to construe a statute in a way that is manifestly unconstitutional. So we would, we it question. would be incumbent upon us then to uh, rule on the constitutionality or to find a constitutional interpretation of the statute. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, now, uh, you can have uh, a statute conferring jurisdiction which might be constitutional in some cases and not constitutional in others. Uh, I How are we to determine that issue, given the certified question? Well, I, I think the facts of this case uh, offer uh, a clear demonstration that this statute, as we would construe it, uh, can be a constitutional one. Because you have here two individuals who uh, deliberately defrauded a New York resident who was going to operate a New York franchise. There cannot have been any doubt that the harm flowing from those misrepresentations would be felt in New York. And as the Supreme Court said in Calder versus Jones, uh, with the states being slightly different, an individual injured in California need not go to Florida to seek redress from persons who, though remaining in Florida, knowingly caused injury in California. And I suggest that we have exactly the same situation. Thank you here. very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All please rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having any further business before this Court of Appeals, held in for the State of New York, may depart hence, and appear here tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock, which time this Court now stands adjourned.